Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for uh, joining us on this redo of a uh, Unremarkable Labs conference that uh, I messed up and didn't uh, figure out the right way to record it despite my best efforts. Um, this is gonna be a bit of a soliloquy, but uh, I do have uh, one great person in the audience, Drew, just say hello to everybody. Hi everyone. Um, it's, I wasn't able to make it to the original uh, conference, but I'm here now, so hopefully I'll be able to regather what I missed. <laughs> okay, so this is actually a patient uh, that we took care of uh, in the hospital uh, fairly recently. Mm -hmm. um, am I recording? You are. So, this man came in with dyspnea. He, 10 days prior to admission, he'd been in the hospital for dyspnea and needed uh, percutaneous uh, intervention. He had a stent placed. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, over the next 10 days, he decided that his blood pressure medicines were, were causing his shortness of breath. So he stopped taking his blood pressure medicines and stopped taking his diuretic. Uh, and he woke with significant <laughs> dyspnea. He had, he had the known coronary artery disease. He uh, does have HEFREF with uh, his last measured LVEF of 31%, and he ha does have, have an ICD in place. Mm -hmm. He has known uh, stage 3B CKD, has known hypertension, and carries a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, although he's been on diet only for at least the last four years with uh, hemoglobin A1Cs always under 7 and he has a BMI of 24. Which, yeah, didn't make sense if he had, yeah. Yeah, so whether he has diabetes or not, I'm not really clear. Mm -hmm. So when he comes in, his exam is consistent with pulmonary edema. He has a high blood pressure. Uh, he's not quite tachycardic, but he is breathing fairly rapidly and fairly deeply. He has JVD to the uh, angle of the jaw. His heart had regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs. He had bibasal arouse and no peripheral edema. Hmm. So I guess the one thing that I'd want to get um, in, in just after all this is I just want to get an EKG just to see how the electrical activity of his heart is doing, especially considering that he's had that stent placed. And I want to go back into the EKG that they got 10 days prior and see if there was anything that might have suggested to them, oh boy, this patient is having an MI. So uh, his EKG was okay and his troponin was low. Um, and uh, as you can see, his pro-BNP was quite high. So his pro-BNP was, was much higher than it had been before. Hmm. But these were the interesting labs. His chest x-ray showed a small... Uh, pleural effusion. Um, his CBC was really, even for me, unremarkable. Yeah. Um, but he did have these admission labs. The, this creatinine of 1.9, we'll talk about some more in a few minutes, but that's about what he's been running. Uh, the bicarb of 15 was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and when, it, when the patient was presented to me the next morning, obviously, uh, I, I thought about that. We'll get to that in a second. I'm just we're, calculating we're the gap right now. Yeah, uh, his his gap is 13 with an albumin of 4.3, so that's a normal gap. Yeah. So he got IV loop diuretics overnight. Um, I go to the bedside with the team the next morning. Uh, his dyspnea is his better. His lungs are clear. He has no JVD, but he's still breathing hard and deep. So he. He periodically is tachypnic, but he also, you can tell that he is uh, taking large tidal volume and hyperventilating. He just doesn't look right. Um, why, do, why do I get the feeling that he's kusmalling? He's not kusmalling, but it's a okay. great thought, but he was not kusmalling. Okay. Uh, so we go back to the team room. And today, uh, despite this diuresis, uh, his bicarbonate is 14. He still has a normal gap. And the annoying attending, that being me, uh, mm -hmm. asks why. 
And I think this was the one where you actually asked, you you shouted the question to the entire world, why is this happening? Right. Um, so that's what we're going to go over and see what all this means and why this might have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the story uh, has up to this point a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a normal gap acidosis. The first thing we have to do is make sure the patient doesn't have a respiratory alkalosis. So, so we need which to get means some, some kind of blood gas. Yeah, VBG. Yeah, and there's no reason to get an ABG at this time because his O2 sat was perfectly fine. Yeah. So then he's either losing bicarbonate or has an inability to buffer his daily intake. That's, mm -hmm. that's what causes normal gap acidosis. If he's losing bicarbonate, it would be GI losses and it should be diarrhea predominantly. He denied any diarrhea. There's no evidence of diarrhea in the hospital. You could lose bicarbonate because of a proximal RTA. Uh, he was not on acetazolamide. He was not on tenofovir. So acetazolamide, by definition, causes a normal gap acidosis because it lowers mm -hmm. the bicarbonate reabsorption right. threshold. Mm -hmm. Tenofovir, uh, I have seen one case of it, uh, uh, does uh, cause uh, proximal uh, tubular dysfunction, uh, and you get uh, glycosuria, you get amino aciduria, you get phosphaturia, and you get uh, normal gap acidosis. Mm -hmm. uh, not very common, uh, but, I, but I have seen it. Right. Most normal gap acidosis in the United States is due to the inability to buffer your daily intake of acid. Mm -hmm. So here's the, here's the idea. We have approximately one milliquillum per kilogram per day of acid in our diet. That's mostly protein, a little bit less if you're on a pure vegetarian diet and eating less protein. Um, but we, there's a certain amount we do have to buffer. Mm -hmm. And the I think phosphates occurs, and sulfates as well, right? Hmm? That we have to buffer. We have to also buffer essentially phosphoric acid as well. well okay, so there, there, are two, there are two buffers. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you brought that up, Drew, because there are two buffers. There's phosphate. And phosphate is just part of the diet. We can't, our body can't adjust that. All the phosphate that's excreted, we don't have good mechanisms for adjusting that to excrete more phosphate. So we can't buffer all of the acid just with phosphate. Mm -hmm. That's called titratable acid. Mm -hmm. Non-titratable acid is ammonia. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can manipulate. Our, our, our kidneys adjust how much ammonia is gonna be excreted as ammonium. Now, I don't mm -hmm. have a picture of this, so I'm gonna go through this and stop me if I'm not making sense, Drew, please. Mm -hmm. We make the ammonia in the proximal tubular cells. It's, a, it's the classic, we all learned this, we all forgot it, glutamine to glutarate, mm -hmm. with the enzyme glutaminase. Mm -hmm. That spins off NH3 that goes into the proximal tubule. Mm -hmm. NH3 immediately, once it hits the proximal tubule, because the proximal tubule is already a little bit acidotic, becomes NH4+. Mm -hmm. NH4 plus goes down the descending limb of Henle's loop, comes up to the ascending limb where the sodium potassium 2-chloride cotransporter is. We love that, and we've been messing with it already in this patient because we're giving them loop diuretics. Right. It turns out that not just sodium and potassium are, are not the only cations that are reabsorbed there and transported there. NH4 but plus ammonium is also. Can be. What? Mm -hmm. But ammonium can be reabsorbed there as well. It, mu it must be of a similar size and because it has right. that charge. Yeah, it's, it's really the small cation chloride transporter. So what happens is virtually all the ammonium that gets to that point goes into the interstitium and becomes part of the countercurrent mechanism because as soon as it hits the interstitium in the medulla, it goes back to NH3. So we have a lot of NH3 in the medulla, not very much in the cortex. Right. So in which case, if it goes and is part of the countercurrent mechanism, that affects the ability of the kidney to concentrate and um, affect basically the solute composition of the urine. So would we want to get a UA in this patient just to see what exactly the 
etiology might be? We will be getting to that. And uh, it's a good question. And let, let's see if I can tell you the rest of the story. So mm -hmm. that's a no so the ammonia is a normal part of the countercurrent mechanism. So it really doesn't change anything. Right. Uh, it's, it's part of yours and my countercurrent mechanism. Mm -hmm. the, way, the way we get rid of the acid is we take microequivalents of acid with a classic buffer system, the NH3 passively diffuses into the distal tube, you'll become NH4 plus, and those microequivalents of acid become milliequivalents of ammonium. Hmm. And so, and it's a classic buffer system, and that's why it works. Hmm. So, what could go wrong? Well, first of all, if you can't acidify the urine, you can't get rid of the ammonium. That's distal RTA. Mm -hmm. The next thing is if you don't make enough ammonia and you don't concentrate it enough. So what happens in uh, chronic kidney disease, and it's usually not till uh, uh, stage four or five, but sometimes 3B, what happens is you have less proximal tubular cells, so you make less ammonia. Mm -hmm. Then remember, the countercurrent mechanism is hard to explain, but, but I, I really did see a very nice video on it recently, and it's very flow dependent. Mm -hmm. If you speed up the flow through the tubule, you can't get the, as much of a gradient, and that's why people with stage four chronic kidney disease tend to make the same amount of urine every single day. That's why they're more prone to volume contraction, because they mm -hmm. can't they can't concentrate their urine. There's the, whatever they are, they're, they're fixed there day after day after day. It's a mass transfer issue. It's a, it ba basically, it's not, it doesn't run slow enough that it allow, allows diffusion to work properly right. around the entirety of its route. Exactly. So now, we now we've made less ammonia, we're concentrating it less, so we have a very small amount of ammonia. So even if we can, even if we can acidify our urine, which we can usually in chronic kidney disease, we just can't, we don't have enough ammonia to get rid of all those milliequivalents. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a classic problem, probably happens in about 25% of people with advanced chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. If he really does have, if he, if he had diabetic nephropathy, and I, and I don't know for sure if he had diabetic nephropathy, he did not have proteinuria when we saw him, although there were, were some previous urinalyses that suggested he might have. Mm -hmm. So what happens in many people with diabetes, it also happens occasionally with sickle cell and lupus, is you knock, you knock out part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus and therefore you have hyporenin and because you have hyporenin, you have hypoaldo and therefore you get hyperkalemia. Now, what the heck does, Potassium have to do with this. Well, it turns out potassium is a cofactor for glutaminase. And huh. high potassium inhibits glutaminase. Hmm. Now this, the, look, look, we have some symmetry here. Low potassium stimulates glutaminase. That's one of the reasons low potassium is a risk factor for hepatic encephalopathy because you make more ammonia. Because you make more ammonia. Yeah. Huh. So, and the other thing that would happen would be a urine to bout collection, connection, because that essentially becomes a distal RTA. So for example, someone has an artificial bladder. It's usually, so we used to call them ileal conduits. Mm -hmm. um, if that's too long and the dwell time in that artificial bladder is too much time, there's time for that pH of five to have to go back up to, to seven because the epithelium does not have tight junctions. It has regular loose junctions in, mm -hmm. in the bowel. So you can, you can get a normal gap acidosis with urine bowel collections. If the urine is going into the bowel and, and stays there too long, you can end up with something. Okay, so what did we do? Well, we said we got to and figure for, out. And one more thing. So the type 4 RTA is basically the same explanation as if you gave someone, say, spironolactone or a plerinone. 
so spironolactone, aplerinone, sometimes ACE inhibitors. Uh, this, this gentleman was not on an ACE inhibitor because he'd had a bad cough before. ARBs, anything that'll increase potassium mm -hmm. can cause a type 4 RTA. The type 4 RTA is hyperkalemic, Kalemic. normal gap acidosis. Huh. Remember, both proximal RTA and distal RTA present with hypokalemia. Okay. Right. So just looking at the potassium, and remember this guy's potassium was 4.5, which immediately made us think that it's not going to be a distal RTA and not going to be a proximal RTA. So it's either a type 4 or it's advanced CKD. And that's what we're going to get to. So his VBG confirms that he has uh, a metabolic acidosis with uh, adequate compensation. So uh, 11 times one and a half is 16 and a half plus eight is uh, 24 and a half is PCO2 is 22. That's close enough. So he's that when, when I looked at him and he looked like he was hyperventilating, in fact, he was hyperventilating. By definition, that's hyperventilation. And we can explain the hyperventilation not by hypoxia because his O2 set's really good at this point, but rather by his acidosis. Now, mm -hmm. we had measured a bicarb of 14, the VBG was 11, it's cl close enough. All we know is that we're gonna have to do something about this. Mm -hmm. His urine pH is five, further excluding distal RTA. Mm -hmm. We got urine electrolytes, which gives us a urine anion gap of plus eight and therefore it's a renal cause. So let me go over the urine anion gap. I tried to make a slide to make this make sense. Drew, you have to help me and tell me if the slide works. Okay, this is how it's supposed to work. Cations in the urine have to equal anions or else our bladder blows up, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, that's simple. Normally the, cat, the cations that we measure are sodium, potassium, and we're gonna assume we're measuring ammonium and those three should be a little bit larger than chloride because phosphates and a couple other things are in there, but mm -hmm. not a lot. If we, have, if we have diarrhea, there's nothing wrong with the ammonia system. So we'll have a lot of ammonia. Mm -hmm. so the sodium potassium will be less than the chloride. Mm -hmm. So therefore we'll have a negative a negative yeah. anion gap, or as uh, Kidney Boy teaches us, uh, negative, or or was that? Uh, I think that was. I think that was in the CP solver schema. I think. I think that. I think that was the magician who said that. Yep, it was. <laughs> I think it was a magician. Mm -hmm. um, renal causes. We have very little ammonia, so the sodium potassium will be greater than the chloride, and that so tells the us be positive. that. So, so we're we're. Now this is not perfect, but it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. and, and it would be better if we actually measured ammonia, but we can deduce, we can deduce fairly well. There's a lot of logic here. Mm -hmm. So we go back and look at the chart. This guy sometimes has normal bicarbonate and sometimes low. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have records over the last four years. Mm -hmm. And I can't prove this, but it seems that about three times he'd had a slightly elevated potassium, always 5.2 for some reason. And then after that was measured, the next time he came in, he had a low bicarbonate. So he, ha he probably has enough CKD to cause the metabolic acidosis by itself, but maybe there's some intermittent uh, type 4 RTA. And when I, when I discussed this on Twitter, uh, Joel Toff, uh, mm -hmm. also known as Kidney Boy, uh, mm -hmm. said maybe it's a funky type 4 RTA. Um, and, and it was not due to an ACE inhibitor. It would have been due to this kidney disease. Now let's just question, is, question is funky in what way? Uh, that's not always there. Ah. So let's go back and talk about his 
uh, renal function because I was discussing this with another nephrologist and she made a wonderful point. And I, so I wanna share this with everybody. The creatinine of 1.9, this, this man happens to be African-American. So I did the MDRD including race and not including race. And it, it changed, changes from about 44 down to about 39. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the confidence interval of our estimation of uh, renal function is pretty wide. Mm -hmm. Now, this nephrologist who is at a uh, large academic center outside of my academic center said that if it was in her clinic, she would probably uh, redo the GFR using cystatin C. Mm -hmm. That's what they do at her place. That We don't do that at our place, uh, but that's very reasonable because cystatin C is not dependent upon muscle mass. This, right. this guy was not real muscular. Mm -hmm. So he actually, he actually could be uh, stage four chronic kidney disease for all we know, because we're just, all we have is an estimate. And right. the fact that he gets this severe acidosis uh, suggests that maybe his renal function is actually worse than we know. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's an ongoing problem that we have to think about. But in the meantime, we need to fix this acidosis because this acidosis has very important sequelae in terms of his quality of life. Mm -hmm. So what would you do, Drew? Hmm. I would okay, probably, I'll show you what we did. I, I, would, I would probably start him on oral bicarb supplementation. Um, I'm trying to think of what the dose would be. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna go over the doses, and I, I think you'll enjoy and enjoy understanding the doses. So, we gave. W w I like to treat it with IV to get it back to where it should be, and then switch to oral. Because mm -hmm. if, if you go to bullet point two, we calculated a deficit of around 280 milli equivalents. Mm -hmm. His target's 22 and his actual is 14, that's eight. Multiply that times 35 and you get 280. Right. And the reason 35 liters, the patient uh, was approximately 70 kilograms and the bicarbonate space is the total body water space, which is about half of his weight, especially at his age. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to give him too much sodium because he'd just been volume overload with his heart failure, but I thought we could get away with very slowly while we're continuing to diurese him, giving him 150 milliequivalents of sodium bicarbonate added to a liter of D5 and W and we ran it in over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. The next, we go see him the next day, he's breathing better than he has in a long time. He said he felt better than he had in several months. He's no longer using accessory muscles and he's very comfortable talking to us, says he's been walking around. Hmm. So we discharged him with instructions to take a half a teaspoon of baking soda each day and follow up in clinic in 10 days with repeat lab tests. Uh, I know uh, the resident who's following him in clinic, and I'm actually going to go to the clinic uh, when he shows up just to check to make sure, number one, he shows up and make sure his lab tests are okay. Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of time re-looking at what, what was going on with this, this man, and I am really concerned uh, that he does get hyperkalemic at times. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things we did is we started him on sacobutrol and uh, uh, losartan mm -hmm. or entresto. Yeah. He could get hyperkalemic from that. So that, that, that may be a rate limiting step. The other thing that he has an absolute indication for that medication. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, yeah, he is know. the classic guy who should be on that medication, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the patient that 
if he does get hyperkalemic again and gets an acidosis, I would make an argument that he should be put on pteromer or localma mm -hmm. that are both potassium binding agents. This is the unusual case where, he, where I think he has a very strong indication, at least for an ACE or an ARB, but I think that with the current data uh, and his EFs still being in a place where we can really slow things down and keep him fairly healthy, uh, getting him on an entresto uh, makes a lot of sense if he'll take it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the rate limiting step is hyperkalemia, that's what most cardiologists and nephrologists think is the indication for pteromere localma. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of complicated. Um, we'll see whether or not the half teaspoon of baking soda uh, works. That's the cheapest way and the easiest way to tell them to take bicarbonate. 30 milliequivalents a day uh, should be okay, but it might be a little bit too much. We may go back to having them take it every other day. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a titration problem. Right. So that's our story. And that's, that's the, the case of the man who had dyspnea for two different reasons. He had two very legitimate reasons for dyspnea. This was really Hickam's dictum. We treated, we, when we treated the pulmonary edema successfully, we revealed an underlying cause for, for dyspnea, hmm. which was the metabolic acidosis, which I thought was, was interesting and understanding how that interplays with how he feels, I think is pretty important. The, 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 uh, data suggests that everyone with a normal gap acidosis should be corrected to normal aggressively. Mm -hmm. Whereas with an anion gap acidosis, you almost never try to correct it. You try to treat what is causing the anion gap acidosis. Right. So uh, since you've been so kind to listen to me pontificate, Drew, mm -hmm. what did you get out of this case and what questions do you have? I guess the first question that I had was, um, I guess, given now that we have electrolyte abnormalities that are, that it may be difficult to treat even with, you know, aggressive titration of medication and the fact that he has at least estimates of his GFR to the point where he's bordering on CKD4, um, would this patient be a candidate for possibly hemodialysis or bumping him up the renal transplant list? Uh, so I don't know if he's a transplant candidate. I think we do need to get nephrology involved. Mm -hmm. we, we did all this ourselves. Um, I think we can control pteromere, but the point that you make that we're now thinking he's at least 3B, but might possibly be four, but we just can't tell that he's four because the way we estimate GFR might not be adequate. Um, we need to be thinking about that. I don't think anybody's gonna wanna dialyze him for this if we can control the potassium and control the bicarb. I think trying to figure out how much bicarb to give him. The other point that I think is really important um, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, uh, a normal gap acidosis in someone with chronic kidney disease speeds progression of kidney disease to end stage. Mm -hmm. And by treating it, you can slow down the progre progression. Mm -hmm. And what's good is this guy does not have significant proteinuria at this time. Mm -hmm. So uh, one would guess that his high that it's hypertension is probably the primary cause of his kidney disease. And we may be able to keep him from progressing to end stage mm -hmm. uh, by controlling the bicarb and controlling his blood pressure. Um, right. So if you can, if you can do that, that, that is, that would be great. Now, if, if it becomes untenable for us to treat his heart failure and controls potassium, then we might have to have to, Think about dialysis, but I'm when I talk to nephrologists, they really, really like to delay dialysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the other question that I had was, I don't know why, but the the 
the possibility of putting this guy on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and I don't know if he already was, um, came up in my mind. I know it's not exactly going to even go near anywhere what this problem, um, the main issue that this patient has, but I was just wondering if there were any thoughts about uh, possibly considering doing it after getting this issue under control. I am so glad you said that, Drew. That is, that is a great point. We did talk about it, uh, and we may have started it. We may have started. I may have forgotten that we started it because I don't ha I have a copy of the uh, admission note, but I don't have a copy of the discharge summary here. I remember we did talk about it, and it doesn't matter if he had if his diabetes is active or not, because as as you're implying, absolutely correctly, uh, many many cardiologists are now starting SGLT2s in patients like this who are not diabetic because uh, of the dapagliflozin trial. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, think, I think we did, uh, but if we didn't, uh, that's on the list of things for primary care to consider. Right. And I think he's going to be seen also by cardiology. Mm -hmm. But that's a great point. That's just a great point. And it just, and I guess it just makes you wonder, given that this underlying issue was there now that we're addressing it, might it be worth it now to try and think about reintroducing some of the medications that he was initially put on after his, um, his PCI, but stopped because he was still having symptoms? Yeah, so he um, was not the... Uh most uh, medication literate patient I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent a lot of time talking to him about what, why he was taking the medications and what each medication was, would do and what, why they were necessary. Uh, we, just, we sent him home on some torsamide uh, with instructions of when to take it and when not to take it. Mm -hmm. um, we thought that the, the baking soda uh, would control his acidosis in the short run. We really encouraged him to take the uh, new medication in Tresto, which we think will uh, work real well in him. Mm -hmm. But if he, he had some thought process that the medications were actually hurting him rather than helping him. Uh, mm -hmm. And th that's going to take a lot of education. And that, and that's, that's the challenge. Uh, we, we can figure out exactly how to treat patients, but we can't always figure out how to get patients to buy into that and adhere to our suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that's, that's really going to be a primary care problem. He has a very, very good resident uh, as his primary care physician, and uh, I'll be talking to him in a few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this this case is one of those patients who it was an interesting case coming in to uh, of having him come in to the inpatient service and he's going to be a, an interesting case in terms of management outpatient and um, it, it seems like it's one of those these cases that's probably going to be a big topic when I come in intern year. Um, since I'm going into med peds and a lot of med peds um, uh, focus is on primary care. This, yeah. this patient might be one of the big ones that we'd be discussing. He, this is a very nice guy, really enjoyed uh, being his physician. Um, and the, you're hundred percent right. The quality of primary care and the ability for us to connect with him and get him to work and take control of his decreased ejection fraction, systolic dysfunction, and his hypertension is going to be the key to him having better quality of life. So mm -hmm. our challenge is uh, to deal with his relatively low literacy about medications 
us understanding exactly what uh, the studies suggest would help him and try to figure out how to work that out to, to help him. That's one of the challenges of medicine. Right. Um, but I thought, I thought it was an interesting case. We had a great discussion about it uh, last week. And Drew, I can't thank you enough for uh, being willing to spend the time with me to uh, record this. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, looking forward to this, uh, this coming Tuesday and um, what case you'll have in store for us. <laughs>